Welcome everyone to Daf Yomi One Week at a Time, Masachet Baba Metzia. Uh, this is our seventh class, and today we're going to be reviewing Daf 43 to 49. Um, so we are going to begin on Daf 43 with the Mishnah. Um, the Mishnah tells us that if you deposit money at a money changer, um, if it was bundled up, right? So again, if it, not if it's a loose change, but if it was bundled up, so then you're not allowed to use it. Um, the money changer isn't allowed to use it. Therefore, he isn't responsible if it gets lost. Um, if the money is loose change, he can use it. Um, and therefore, he's if he uses it, he's responsible if it gets lost. Um, now, if you remember, we were talking about um, different people who are guarding different things and their levels of responsibility. So if you deposited it with a regular person, so you can never use it, um, and therefore that person is not responsible at all. Um, the storekeeper, so again, we had a money changer who uses money all the time, and you have a regular person who's not allowed to use it at all, but the storekeeper who's somewhere in between um, is like is like a regular person, or no, he's like the money changer. So that was the Mishnah. So now the Gemara explains money that was bundled and it was stamped, so you can't use it. Or maybe it had like a unique knot, and that's why you can't use it. Um, the money changer is even responsible for unavoidable accidents, or he's not responsible for unavoidable accidents. He's like a borrower. So the question is, is he like a borrower where he's responsible for everything, or he doesn't have that level of responsibility, right? Because he can use it. So he's like somebody who's getting paid to watch it. Um, and therefore, he has a certain level of responsibility. Um, the treasurer of the temple of the Beit HaMikdash, if he deposited money, but it was sanctified money by accident with um, a money changer, and if it was bundled, so the money changer isn't allowed to use it. And if he does, he's liable for misappropriating sanctified money, right? This is called mi'ila. Mi'ila is when you steal money from God, meaning you use money that belongs to the temple, to the Beit HaMikdash. If the money was loose, so then it's the treasurer who's liable um, for misappropriating the funds. Okay, the next Mishnah, Andaf 49, uh, Andaf, sorry, Andaf 43, tells us that if the, gar the guardian, the Shomer, um, if he, um, touches um, or uses collateral that was deposited by him, and then it gets destroyed. So he's liable for any increase or decrease in its value. This is according to Beit Shammai. Beit Hillel say, say that he only pays the value at the time of um, when it was removed, when he used it. Rabbi Akiva says he pays the value at the time uh, when they get to court, meaning we're going to see um, different times when the person um, becomes liable for uh, the damage that was done. So now the Gemara explains if a person stole, um, if a person stole wine, um, when it was now again, wine changes its value. So if a person stole wine when it was worth one Zeus and then it gets destroyed um, and it gets destroyed when it's worth four Zeus, meaning it went up in value. Um, if he drank it or he broke the barrel, so he has to pay four, meaning at the time when it was destroyed. But if it broke on its own, he pays one zoos, meaning the value when he it was deposited by him um, and when he initially picked it up. Um, okay, so now um, it's so now the question is, what does it mean um, at the time uh, that it was um, at the time that it was removed? What does that mean? Um, so it means, is it when it broke or when you stole it? 
So there, there are basically four different, four different opinions. The first opinion is when he took it out of the house of the owner, even if it went up in price later on, you don't have to pay uh, the increase in value. Um, another opinion is that everybody agrees that when it goes up in value, you have to pay the difference in value. Um, when it went down in value, that's when we have a machloket. Sorry about the background noise. Uh, I'm still uh, uh, in the house of my with my grandchildren, so I apologize for any background noise. Um, okay, um, the third opinion is that the um, the shomer, the guard, the guardian moved it from for his own benefit. So if he moved it for his own benefit. So then Beit Shammai says, if he moved it without permission, so then it's called stealing, and then it becomes his at the high value. Um, and therefore, even if it goes down in value, he needs to pay at the high value. Um, Beit Hillel say that using it without permission isn't considered theft, and therefore, he only pays the value when it was destroyed. Um, the fourth opinion is that um, there's a machluk when the item itself went up in value, um, but um, if it went, um, again, when it went up in value, Beit Shammai say that the gain belonged to the owner, um, and Beit Hillel say, that it belongs to the thief. Therefore, let's say you sell, let's say you, a person steals sheep. So then you pay for the shearings um, and for the babies, if they had babies, or no, um, the, the thief is allowed to keep it and he does not have to pay for that value. Okay, the halacha is like Rabbi Akiva, um, who said that you pay at the the time the 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 value at the time of the court case, but if there are witnesses, you can pay the value of the item when it was destroyed. If not, you pay the value um, at the time of the claim in court. Um, okay, the next Mishnah tells us if a person intends to use the deposit, so then. Um, Beit Shammai say that he's liable from the moment that he has an intention to use the item, even if he didn't use the item yet. Um, Beit Hillel say you're not liable until, until you actually use the item. Um, if the Shomer um, tipped the barrel, um, so if, again, the, the person who's watching it tipped the barrel and took out um, a rivit, right, a quarter of a log of wine, and then afterwards it broke. He's only responsible for the rivit that he took because he never pick, he never picked up the barrel, um, and therefore he never acquired um, the barrel. Um, if he lifted the barrel and then it broke, he's responsible for the entire barrel. Okay, Da 44, the Gemara says, ta, says that there's a verse that says that you're liable for all negligence. So the question is, what does that mean, all negligence? Beach and I say that this includes intent to use it. Beit Hillel say, no, negligence means when you actually use it. Again, the word in Hebrew is shlichat yad, when you, when you actually pick it up and use it. Um, that's when you become liable for it. Um, if he tipped it and the wine became sour, so again, it became, right, sour means he destroyed the wine. So he's liable for the whole thing because, because he removed the rivi'it, he caused it to become sour. So I don't know so much about wine, but apparently the Gemara is saying that if a barrel is full, it'll keep and if you take out some of the wine, I guess it adds air and maybe that makes it become sour. I just made that up, but that's what it seems to be saying in the Gemara. Um, if again, if he lifted the barrel, 
even if he didn't take the rivi'it yet, he's still liable because when he lifted it, it's so that he could use it and therefore he acquired it. Okay, with that, we finish the third chapter um, where we were discussing Shomerim. Um, the next chapter, the fourth chapter, um, is going to be discussing um, acquiring something, let's say, for a sale. We have seen this before in this Masechet and in the last Masechet, um, but this is going to be the source of when does someone acquire an item. So according to Halacha, when one buys something, you need to acquire it, right? The word in Hebrew is to do a kinyan. Kinyan is an act of acquisition. And we know that an act of acquisition is either lifting the item or pulling the item. Um, and when you do that, the item, the sale is final. Now, if you paid for the item, it is not a final sale, right? This is a little bit different than the way we think, right? In our minds, once you pay for something, then it's yours. Um, in the time of the Mishnah and the Gemara, Paying for something is not enough, and we'll see why in a minute. So if you pay for it, but you didn't lift the item, <laughs> the sale isn't final yet. And you need, and and not only that, we need to discuss, and in, in, in this mission is going to discuss, which item is considered the merchandise and which item is considered the payment. And, and you'll see in a minute, right, let's say you're, you're trading uh, different types of coins, right, gold coins for silver coins. We have to identify which one is the payment and which one is the produce, right? So again, when you lift the produce or the, the item you're buying, the sale is final. When you lift up the money, the payment, the sale is not final. Okay, so now the Mishnah tells us, um, we're on Dal 44. The Mishnah tells us, if a person is exchanging gold coins for silver coins, the gold is seen as the merchandise and the silver is seen as the payment. Therefore, when the person takes the gold, the sale is final. And the reason is that silver was common payment. Right, you pay with silver and you buy gold. Let's say you have silver coins and copper coins. The copper is the merchandise, um, because right because they're seen as bad coins. Um, what are bad coins? Either they're discontinued or they're worn out. Those are all seen as merchandise, and the good coins are seen as payment. Um, if you have an asimon, uh, those of you, if you know, in Israel, there used to be um, tokens that you used for the payphone. Those were called asimonim. Uh, that comes from here. The word asimon means a token. Um, we'll see there are two different explanations. Here, it means um, an unminted coin. So an unminted coin are seen as merchandise versus minted coins, which are money. Um, and let's say you have... Um, items, right, metaltaline, um, some type of item versus money. The money is always seen as payment. Um, let's say you have movable items. Um, again, I'm, I'm going to trade you a cup for a blanket. So then, um, and we'll, we'll talk about what type of kinyan you're going to be doing. So then um, each of them is seen as merchandise. Um, so now the Gemara, the Mishnah says, how does acquisition work? If you take the merchandise, the sale is final. And if you take the money, so then the sale is not final. Rabbi Shimon says that if a person received money, he has the upper hand. And we're going to see what this means. Okay, so now the Gemara explains. Rabbi originally, um, originally thought that the because gold is more valuable, it's considered payment. But now he realized that because silver is circulated more, it's seen as the payment and it's not about value. Um, copper, um, there were places that it circulated more, therefore it was seen as payment, but not everywhere. Therefore, silver is seen as the payment and copper is seen as the merchandise. 
um, other rabbis also saw that or thought that gold should be the payment rather than merchandise, because again, it's more expensive. Um, Beit Shammai say that you cannot redeem your silver coins of a Ma'aser Shemi into gold coins, um, but Beit Hillel said that you could. So here we have a redeeming, right? Again, Ma'aser Shemi was money um, that was sanctified and that you had to take to Jerusalem. So you're really, you want to redeem it onto the largest coin, right? Meaning the most expensive coins so that you can carry fewer coins. Um, that's why Beit Hillel say that you can. Why do Beit Shammai say you can't? Because they hold that because, because silver is money and gold is only merchandise and you cannot redeem Ma'asir Shani onto merchandise. You can only redeem it onto money. Um, Beit Hillel say that gold is also seen as payment. Therefore, you could do it as well. Um, Beit Shammai agree that you can redeem produce onto the gold coins, but not Ma'asir Shani coins into gold coins. Um, okay, Da 45 tells us that you cannot borrow a dinar to pay back a dinar. Right, so maybe this is talking about gold, and then here you see gold isn't currency, it's seen as produce. So we say, no, um, no, that's not the case. Um, copper coins of Maaser Shani, let's say you want to transfer the sanctity onto silver coins, right? Because the Gemara tells us that there are 768 copper coins in every one silver coin. So you're going to want to transfer the sanctity onto the silver coins. So one opinion is you can sanctify or transfer all of them into, um, you can transfer all of them. Some say you can only transfer half of the amount um, because uh, we don't want there to be an increase in the in the the amount that's in the market, and that's going to cause the value to go down, right? Because again, everybody's going to want to switch from silver to copper when they get to Jerusalem, and that's going to drive the market down. Therefore, you have to be able to switch it to gold, um, also. And the Gemara says, no, maybe that's different. Okay, um, we said that you can only transfer Master Shani once onto a coin, that's according to Beit Shammai. Beit Hillel say you can actually transfer twice, meaning the produce onto silver, and then from silver onto gold. Um, but as we said, produce onto gold, everybody agrees that that is, that that is okay. Okay, um, silver coins of Ma'asar Shani, what do we do with them? We take them up to Jerusalem, then you transfer them to copper coins. And as we said, you can change all the silver into copper or maybe only half of them, because now we're concerned that maybe you'll have leftover copper coins and you don't want to have leftover copper coins because they get um, they get like moldy um, or like rusted very quickly. Um, and and we don't want Maser Shani coins to get ruined. Therefore, you have to keep some of it as silver. And the Gemara says maybe Jerusalem is different because over there, it says that you can use money for anything that you want. Therefore, you could change all of it to copper. Um, but it doesn't teach us about, in general, how to um, change silver to gold. Um, okay. Um, right, we said everyone agrees that you can transfer the sanctity twice, um, but there's a machlokit if you can transfer silver onto gold, because what's our concern? Maybe you don't have enough silver in order to transfer it to gold, and therefore you're going to delay going to Jerusalem, um, and we don't want you to delay going to Jerusalem. Uh, the Gemara says, no, um, you're not going to delay going to Jerusalem, and therefore you could transfer it. But everyone agrees that you can transfer, as we said, produce onto gold. Okay, now we're going to learn about um, a, a, 
a um, form of acquisition called Kinyan Sudar. Um, it, this is a type of barter um, acquisition, a type of chalipin. Uh, we saw this before when we were in um, in Masachet Kiddushin, we talked about it, um, and in other Masachot as well. Um, and we talked about, right, when, uh, if you've ever seen at a wedding, um, at the, the, the tish, right, or if you're, oh, now, perfect, when you go to sell your chametz, um, a lot of times when you go to sell your chamet, the rabbi will say, lift up my pen, and now you're giving me the um, the ability to sell your chamet on your behalf. This is perfect, right? So that's called kinyan sudar. So we're going to learn how it works. Well, not just yet. But first, the Gemara is going to ask, um, coins can be part of kinyan chalipin. Now, chalipin... Again, Kinyan Sudar is a type of Kinyan Chalipin. Chalipin means we are um, bartering, right? I'm picking up this and you're getting that, right? My cow for your donkey. Um, so the question is, can coins be a uh, part of that? Now, we just said coins are seen as payment and it doesn't work um, for a, an acquisition or sale. Here we want to say, can coins be used for barter? So the Gemara says that coins can be used for Chalipin or no, right? They can't because, again, when you're using coins, I'm looking at the value of the currency. If I'm looking at the value of the currency, that's called payment. That's not called barter, right? Barter needs to be something, um, right? One movable item for another movable item, right? Where it's uh, it has a fixed value or a stable value as opposed to currency whose value fluctuates. So uh, the Gemara says that our Mishnah is not about bartering, it's talking about currency and buying an item, right? And that only works one way. Only when you pick up the merchandise, that's when the sale is um, is uh, final. Now, if you um, pick up the money, it's not enough to finalize the sale. But if you're doing a barter, Kinyan Chalipin, it should be enough. Um, so again, you need to give the coins um, that you said you would give, either old coins or new coins, meaning when you make a sale, you need to keep to the deal that you made. And we're going to talk more about um, verbal agreements. Um, um, okay, we did say, however, the Gemara teaches us that coins can be acquired through barter, right? So me picking up my cup can um, be a way that you can acquire the coins. Um, Duff 46 tells us that a person can give his Ma'asar Shani produce as a gift to his friend, and then he can redeem them with money that he has at home. Now, maybe he could have used money that he had, right? If he had money with him, he could have used it as a barter. So the Kamara says, no, uh, coins, as we said, cannot be acquired through Khalipin. So now the Kamara says, no, um, coins can't make Khalipin, right? Coins can't be the thing that creates the barter, but maybe they could be the things that is acquired through the barter. Um, okay, next, a person needs to pay his workers, but let's say he doesn't have any money on him, so he asks the money changer to give him money, a dinar, and then he said, I have a dinar at home, so when I get home, I'll give you the dinar plus a little bit more later. So if he has the coins in his house, it works because um, we're going to say that it's chalipin, you're bartering. I'm taking this and I'm going to give you that. But if he doesn't have those coins in his house, it looks like it's a loan. Now, if I borrow one dinar and I pay back a dinar plus a little bit more, that looks like interest, which we know is not allowed, and therefore you're not allowed to do it. Um, maybe we're talking about 
blank copper coins, right? Meaning regular barter, regular, regular chalipin works because um, if it's blank coins, it's not currency. Therefore, it does work. Um, or maybe it could be regular coins, um, but because he doesn't have access to his money in his house, but because it's in his house, it doesn't look like it's interest. Okay, anything that's evaluated like money can be used as a barter, right? So as, as soon as one person lifts one item, the other person acquires the other item, right? So now, as we said, let's say you have um, utensils and right, kalim, some sort of utensil, and you have produce, right? Anything that grows. So you can do chalipin with either one of these items. Or no, um, you cannot do chalipin with animals, right? We're going to see chalipin or barter can only be done with certain types of items. So let's say um, Reuven buys an ox from Shimon, and then Reuven pulls the ox, and then instead of paying Shimon, he says, you know what? I have a cow, and it's worth the same amount as your ox, so I'll give you my cow and uh, because you gave me your ox. So Shimon agrees. When he agrees to this, the sale is final, right? Because it's like he's paying him, but um, it's like he's paying him money, but it's really a barter. So therefore, as soon as he took the animal, the other animal becomes his. Um, Okay, so now the Gemara says, really, money does create an actual sale according to the Torah, meaning de oraita, it really creates a sale, but the rabbis decreed that it doesn't, so that if the seller, right, again, what, how does it work? Let's say I go to a store and I want to buy, you know, um, 10 pounds of wheat, and it's in your, it's in the seller's um, warehouse. So if I say, oh, I'll give you the money, um, and now it becomes mine, let's say the, the seller has a fire in the warehouse. So he's going to be like, oh, it's the buyers already. He paid me. I'm not going to put out the fire because it's not mine. So the Gemara says that the rabbis decreed that the, the sale isn't final till the buyer picks up the, all the wheat. If he doesn't pick up the wheat, it's still under the, the uh, responsibility of the seller. Therefore, if a fire happens, the seller has to go and put out the fire because it's going to be his loss. Now, coins that were taken out of circulation are not seen as currency. Therefore, they can, um, they can be used for barter. Excellent. Zohar is asking an excellent question. Um, we've been talking about what's called hagbaha, um, lifting an item. And Zohar asks, how can you lift a cow or an ox? Don't worry, you do not have to lift it. Another way to acquire an item is called mishicha, right, where you pull it. Um, so you can either, right, lead the cow, right, hold it by the reins and make it move. Um, uh, some say that you can, like, hit it and make it move. Um, and then if you make it move, you have acquired it. Um, so that is an excellent question. There's a very funny um, a discussion in the Gemara, how can you lift up an elephant, actually, it says, not even a cow, but an elephant. And the Gemara says that if you pile up some dirt and you make the the, the elephant go up uh, a few tfachim off the ground, that's called lifting the animal. Um, but interestingly enough, you would have to, let's say, pick up a sheep or a goat because those are small, so you would have to lift them. Um, excellent question. Okay, and we'll get to all of that, um, but a little bit later in the Masechet. Okay, um, let's say a buyer says, um, sell me an item for the coins that I have in my hand, right? So he picks up like a, a, a bag full of money and he says, okay, I'll give you this bag full of money. You give me whatever, the, the, the cow. Now, we don't know how much money is here, right? He doesn't say for $10. He says, the money that I have in my hand. Um, so here, because he doesn't specify it, it's, it's, it can be 
uh, with chalipit, with a barter. It's not seen as money. Um, so as soon as the seller takes the coins, the sale is final. Um, da 47 tells us that if the seller can claim fraud, uh, sorry, the sale is final when he takes the money, but the seller can claim fraud if it's below a sixth of the value. And we're going to talk more about this in a few minutes. So when, when we get there, we'll talk about price fraud. It's called ona'a, um, and we're going to talk about it in a little bit. Um, or the governor says, no, once you took, right, when you do chalipin, you can't claim price fraud. Um, let's see, if a person is particular about the value of the item, so then the sale isn't final until each party takes possession of the other thing, right? So your cow for my donkey, if, if one person pulls it, that's not enough. The other person has to also pull it. But if you don't care about the value, right, you say, I, I want to trade your cow for my donkey as soon as I one, you acquire the other and the sale is final. Okay. Um, okay. Now, we talked about Kinyan Sudar. So, again, as we said, Khalipin is like bartering one item for another. Now, let's talk about Kinyan Sudar. That's when I lift up something um, that is symbolic. Um, and thereby acquire something else. So how does this work? So the Gemara says that you use, it's called Kinyan Sudar, because Sudar means a kerchief, right? So you use a kerchief. Um, now the question is, whose kerchief do you use? One opinion is that you use the buyer's kerchief, right? So the, the buyer gives the seller the kerchief, he picks it up. As soon as the seller picks up the kerchief, the buyer acquires the item. Or maybe you use the seller's kerchief. And then when the buyer lifts up the kerchief, not only does he get the kerchief, but he also gets the item that he was buying. Um, as we said, there's an exchange. So what's the exchange? The benefit of accepting the seller's kerchief gives the buyer the right to the item. Where do we learn this from? Uh, so we actually learn this from Megillat Root. Um, in Megillat Root, um, if you remember, we have um, the scene where um, the relative of Avimelech, his name is Ploni Almoni, he's the closest relative. Um, and he has the right to the land. Um, Boaz, um, who's our main character, wants to have the right to the land. And therefore, he needs to, Ploni Almoni, which is basically saying John Doe, needs to transfer his right to the land to Boaz. How does he do this? So it says he takes off his shoe and he acquires the rights. Don't get confused when he's taking off his shoe. He's not doing the ceremony of chalitza, which we do see later on. Right here, he's taking off his shoe to do a um, a kimyan sudar, to do a, this um, acquisition with the kerchief. Right here, it's a shoe. Um, so he takes off the shoe to acquire the right. So one opinion is that Boaz gives his shoe to Ploni Almoni, or the other opinion is no, Ploni Almoni, the Goel, gives his shoe to Boaz. So therefore the Gemara says, since it's a shoe, you can use a, uh, you have to use a utensil, a kli for Chalipin, even if it, you can use something that isn't even worth a fruta. Um, but you're not allowed to use a non-utensil, meaning um, produce for Chalipin, or maybe you can use, um, you can use produce, but it can't be, it has to be whole, right? You can't use half a Ramon or half a, a nut, um, or you can't use something that's repulsive. Um, it seems that you can't use coins, um, and you can't use things that are forbidden um, to have any benefit from them. 
Okay, we mentioned in the Mishnah the Asimon. So the Gemara says an Asimon is a token. Um, you can't redeem Maaser Shini on a token, or maybe you can. Um, another opinion is that an Asimon is an unminted coin. Um, and again, we said that we're scared that there's going to be a fire in the warehouse and the seller won't save the item. Therefore, we say um, that the, the buyer only acquires the item when he takes the item. Now, um, the Gemara tells us that Mishicha, pulling the item, is biblical, meaning it, we learn it from the Torah, right? It says that you buy something from the hand of your fellow, of your the other person, right? Something that where you transfer from hand to hand, that's mishicha. Excuse me. Excuse me. Um, or um, maybe the um, maybe the verse is teaching us that um, you cannot have price fraud when dealing with land. Um, and we're going to see about price fraud that it applies to the buyer and to the seller, meaning um, the seller is not allowed to overcharge and the buyer is not allowed to underpay. Um, we're going to talk more about that in a minute. Um, whoever has the money, we said has the upper hand. What does that mean? If the seller has the money, so then only he can renege on the sale, but the buyer, once he pays, is not allowed to back out. Um, the sages, Chachamim, say that both of them can back out, even after he paid for it. Again, he didn't do Mishicha yet, he just paid. Um, the Mishnah told us that if somebody backs out from a deal, the sages curse him. It's called a mishapara. And the word is the person who right backs out or doesn't uphold his side of the bargain. Um, the God who upholds all bargains should give him what is coming to him. It, it, so the, the term is mishapara. Um, that's like the name of the curse. So the sages curse the person who backs out of the deal after he pays. So Dal 48 tells us, maybe also if he reneges only a verbal agreement, um, even without paying, the Gemara says, no, it's not good to back out, but you don't get a curse if it's only a verbal agreement. But if he paid, then you also, um, then you also get curse. The verse proves um, that only taking the produce is it actually the acquisition. Um, when, let's say, a person borrows money and designates an item for collateral, and then he swears falsely about it, he doesn't bring a sacrifice for the theft because the lender never actually acquired the collateral. Only money changed hands, right? That's the loan. So therefore, it shows that money isn't the acquisition. Only picking up the item would have been acquisition. Um, if the item was deposited with the lender, so then it is seen as theft and he would have to bring the sacrifice. Um, if he gave money to the bathhouse attendant, um, right, he's going to go to the bathhouse, so he pays with money. And let's say it was sanctified money. The attendant is liable for misappropriating sanctified money. Again, mi'ila. And um, even if the person didn't go into the bathhouse yet, even if he didn't bathe yet. Now, the Gemara says you didn't do anything. You didn't acquire the service. But if you pay for an item, you need mishikha, right? You need to pick up the item. So here it shows money isn't. Um, doesn't facilitate the acquisition. The Gemara says also you should know that non-Jews, money does make the sale um, valid or final. Um, you do not need Mishicha to make the sale val um, val um, final. Um, the Gemara says there's also support for Rabbi Yochanan. He and Rabbi Shimon hold that money is konet, money does make the acquisition according to the Torah. Okay, um, 
<laughs> the question is when you, the, the person gets the curse, do we inform him that he's going to be cursed by God or do the rabbis actually curse him? So that's a machluket, um, whether um, he's cursed directly or not. Um, let's, uh, the Gemara gives some stories, right? A person puts a down payment for salt, right? So let's say the deal is uh, for a thousand zoos and he pays only 10 and then the value of the salt went up. So the seller thinks, okay, I want to get out of this deal because I can make more money. So he thought that they only acquired a hundred zoos worth of salt, right? Because the person paid for only a hundred zoos as the down payment and he wanted to renege on the rest of the deal. The rabbis told him, no, when a person makes a down payment, the down payment is the acquisition for the whole amount, right? Not just for that part. Um, so now the Gemara discusses down payment, right? If I put down a down payment on a house, well, house is not a good house is not a good uh, example. Um, if I want to, right, I have a business deal where I'm going to buy 100 pounds of wheat and I only put down a small amount of money, did I acquire the amount of grain that I can buy with that small amount of money? Or did I acquire everything because I put down a down payment? So now the Gemara is going to discuss that. An eravon, eravon is a down payment. There's a machluket if it acquires just a portion of the item or the whole item. Okay. Um, you might need to state clearly that the down payment is only partially acquiring the item, but if you don't say that, so then we assume that it's a down payment for the whole thing um, and you acquire all of it, right? So here we have like security versus down payment. Um, for, and now this, is applied, this applies for land and for movable items or no, with movable items, if you gave a down payment for those movable items, you only acquire part of it. If you back out, so then you don't get the curse, you don't get the Misha para. But if you put a down payment on land, you can actually buy it with money. Therefore, if you put down the down payment, you acquire the whole thing. That's why I took back the house, because that's similar to land, right? If I put down a down payment on the land, I bought the whole land, not just part of the land. Um, so if you back out, so then you get a Misha para. Okay, you, we said that you have a mash a security. Um, let's say you put down security for a loan. On Shmita, that loan isn't canceled because you already have the security. It's as if you've paid back the loan. So maybe you only, right, only if the security is the value of the whole loan, right? So if I took out a loan for $1,000, the, the, the collateral needs to be worth $1,000 for it to not be um, canceled by Shmita. Or, um, right, but if it's only part of the value of the loan, only that part is not canceled. Or no, only partially canceled. Um, and that shows that the security is corresponding to the entire loan or no, only to part of the loan. So the Gemara says, no, a secure a mashkon, a collateral is so that you remember the loan. And it's not about preventing the loan from being canceled. Now we have a machloka. Um, if you renege on a verbal commitment, is it a lack of trustworthiness right if i right if you say well we shook on it if i back out am i a terrible person right when you make a verbal commitment you have to be sincere you have to mean it um so now we have a story about a son who goes out and he hires workers for his father and he offered to feed them so before they started working the father said you better tell them that i'm only going to pay them bread and beans Right, so go because right, otherwise they're going to say, I want a big feast. You said you were going to feed us. So this shows that words aren't binding because he's changing the, the initial agreement. The Gemara says, no, the workers knew that the son was just the Shalia, right, is just the um, agent of the father. And they knew that the father is going to tell them what exactly the terms are. Um, 
Rabbi Yochanan says that you cannot renege on a small gift um, because a person believes that you're going to give it, right? If I say, oh, I have a present for you, right? It's $10 and you're like, okay, I'm assuming you're going to get it. But if I told you I'm giving you a present of a million dollars, I'm like, yeah, a million dollars, you're going to give me a million dollars. I don't really believe you. Um, so because it's not really taken seriously, um, you could renege on that on that uh, on that statement. Um, let's say a, a Yisrael, a regular Jew, tells a Levi, um, the master that I have to give you, so I have it here with my produce. Um, if the right, so the, the Gemara says that the Levi can rely on it and make it trumot maser. Right, he he knows that it's there in the person's house. This shows that a person cannot renege because if if the Levi is relying on the Israel to leave it aside. So the Gemara says, no, the case is that he actually gave it to the Levi and then the Levi put it back in his care. So that's how he acquired it. And um, it doesn't show whether you can renege on a deal or not. Um, Okay, um, the Gemara continues and gives different stories about people reneging on business commitments um, and then getting the curse of the Misha Para. Um, let's say a person wants to deposit money and the other person says, um, okay, fine, go, my, my door is open. You can put your money there. So if I say my door is open, it means you can deposit it, but I'm not taking any responsibility, right? He doesn't say, oh, give it to me. Let me see what it is. But if he says, oh, just put it wherever, that means I'm not taking responsibility for it. Um, therefore, if the money is stolen, so then the person doesn't get cursed. Um, and as we said, right, the seller can renege when he has the money and the produce, right? But if the buyer has the produce, that's it. The sale is final. If the seller stored um, um, his wheat in the rented attic of the buyer's house, so then when he gives the money to the seller, the buyer acquires the wheat because they're already in his house. Um, and, as we, uh, and as we said, the buyer can renege even if he paid, as long as he didn't take the produce. Once he takes the produce, the sale is final. Okay, the last Mishnah for today, um, we're going to begin um, the story of uh, the, the, the concept of price fraud. Um, price fraud is called Una'a, and um, the, the Gemara talks about, or the Mishnah and then the Gemara talks about um, what is price fraud? Um, what's the percentage, um, right? As we know, the seller wants to make a profit. The buyer always wants to underpay. How much of a like difference? I'm not an economist, so I'm, I, I'm not good at numbers. Zohar is good at numbers, but um, right? How much is it within the realm of a good business deal? And how much is it that um, it's crazy and not only is it crazy but it means that the sale is void okay so now the gemara tells us what is price fraud it's a sixth uh in in the in aramaic it's called shtut right because sheet is um shin yud taf is six so um shtut means a sixth so either it's overcharging or it's undercharging, um, and the Gemara, the Mishnah gives an example. If you pay four out of twenty-four, right? The difference is four out of twenty-four, which is a six. If he charged too much, then the sale is invalid, and therefore he gets all his money back. Not only that, but the the buyer has time to, or the seller has time to claim fraud in the amount of time it takes him to show the merchandise that he bought to another merchant, right? If he goes to somebody else and says, did I just get ripped off? So that's the amount of time he has to go back to the other seller and say, hey, you just ripped me off, give me my money back. Um, if that time passes and he didn't claim price fraud, that's it. 
we assume that the buyer says, oh, whatever, it's not worth the three dollars. I'm not going back. And and we assume that he's mochel, that he gives up on it. He waves his right to go back and claim fraud. OK, oh, so that's the first part. Rabbi Tarfon says it's not a six, but it's a third, um, which is eight out of 24. Um, however, he gives the buyer the whole day to go check the value of the merchandise. Um, and the, Gemar, the Mishnah explains that originally the merchants were really happy with Rabbi Tarfon because they're like, whoa, we could totally overcharge much more. But then they realized that the person has all day to come back and claim fraud. And they're like, never mind, we're going back to Rabbanan, who say a six. Um, so let's do a little bit of the Gemara and Da 49. Rav says that it's a sixth of the sale, meaning the value of the item. And Shmuel says it's a sixth of the money that was paid. And we're going to see what this means. Um, if it was worth, so those of you who like math, you're going to love this. If you don't love math, so you could just listen and trust me. Um, okay, so if the item is worth six, and the person paid five, so he got a good deal, or seven, meaning he got a bad deal. Um, so, but it's a sixth more, right? Because a sixth of six is one. So if it's one above or one below, everybody agrees that's fraud. Um, and you can go back and get your money back. There's a machluket when it was worth five and you paid six. OK, um, so um, fraud right here, fraud is more the is more than a sixth of the value. But if you paid six, therefore, the fraud is a sixth of the price that was paid. Right again, do we go according to the value, which is five and a sixth of five is I don't know, is help me out Tohar. but if the <laughs> but if it's the amount that you paid right if you paid six right so then a six of the six is one okay just trust me um okay but oh thank you so much Tohar. right point eight um so again do we look at the uh, take a sixth of the amount you paid which is six or of the value which is five um and again that's going to help us determine did you pay a sixth or more um too much and therefore you can claim fraud or no okay or like let's say it was worth seven and you paid six Again, Shmuel says you go according to the price that you paid, and therefore both of these is ona'a, it's fraud, and you have to pay the difference. Ralph says, no, it's more than a six, and therefore the sale is void. We're going to see that there are going to be different levels. There's less than a sixth, which is totally fine. There's a sixth where, and we'll learn this next week, if it's exactly a sixth, then you have to like, um, either you can get your money back. Uh, sorry, the sale stands. Well, it's actually a machloket, but we'll see. There's there's three different things: under a six, a six, or above a six. Everyone agrees that above a six, the sale is void, and you give the merchandise back and you get your money. The machloket is with other things. Now we can't prove from our mishnah if it's talking about value or the amount that was paid. As we said, the buyer has limited time to claim fraud, but the seller can always claim that the buyer underpaid. Um, and the one who was frauded, right, who was, right, who was cheated, has the upper hand. And they can either ask for their money back or the difference in price. Okay, with that, um, we are going to end uh, today's class. Um, don't worry, more math and economics to come. Um, everyone's going to assist me. Um, but I want to wish everyone 
um, a Shabbat Shalom and a Chag Kasher V'Sameach. Ezrat uh, Hashem, we will meet at our regular time next week. Um, it will be Chol HaMoyed for everyone in Israel and outside. Um, so wishing everyone a wonderful Chag um, and see you next week.